Good evening, everyone, and welcome to DIA. Um, my name is Matilde Guidali. I am DIA's associate curator and the organizer of the Artist and Artist Lecture Series, where since 2001, we invite an artist to reflect upon the work of another artist in DIA's collection and past program. And uh, over the course of the years, this uh, simple prompt has accommodated a variety of strategies and modes of address. And um, I'm very excited to introduce tonight's event uh, as an experiment in this tradition, featuring Marina Rosenfeld with Jessica Kenny on Marian Zazila. Uh, but before, I wish to thank everyone at DIA who helped make tonight's possible, and in particular, Max Tannon, Kim Golding, Emily Markert, David Anayamaya, and the visitor service team. DIA's relationship with Marianne Zazila predates the institution, with DIA's co-founder Heiner Friedrich presenting at his Munich gallery in 1969, um, Zazila and Lamont Siang's first dream house environment, as well as publishing a collection of the couple's writings and what would become one of the few authorized recordings of their music, the Black Record, both of which featured on their cover the exquisitely complex line drawings by Zazila. The non-contingency of Young and Zazila's philosophy would imprint Dia's early methodology. In 1974, Dia inaugurated its downtown New York locales with the Couples Dream Festival, which included a new iteration of the Dream House, and over the ensuing decade offered the artist unrestricted funding and housing in continued support of their vision. Most recently, Dia presented a rare and beautiful exhibition of Zazila's calligraphic drawings that Marina visited last spring and in many ways prompted tonight. Since the 1990s, Marina Rosenfeld has taken a foundational position against the autonomy of the musical work and modeled instead relational styles of notation, conduction, execution, and ways in which sound encounters physical and social boundaries and how it leaves traces accordingly. Her intentional play with delineations makes so that her work has been commissioned by performing venues and museums alike. Most recently in New York, you might have seen her work presented at the Artist Institute in 2019 and at Miguel Abreu Gallery in 2021. The program that Marina proposes us tonight is revelatory of her method and argumentative in its form. Marina will lecture on the drawings that Zazila realized over extended periods of time between 1962 and 1991. In the course of her research, Marina realized a set of dub plates and made a composition from them and invited the incomparable vocalist Jessica Kenney to interpret them. And we are very grateful that Jessica accepted our invitation, opening up the declarative lecture format to a chain of conversations and interactions. And so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Marina Rosenfeld with Jessica Kenny on Marian Zazila. Thank you so much, Matilda. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to Dia, and of course, thank you to Jessica. This lecture is about Marianne Zazila. She of the romantic name, Bronx origin, overwhelming, if not obliterating, associatedness. I'm mainly looking at her extraordinary drawings, which she produced between 1962 and 1991. I was surprised to learn that none, of, that none turn out to be actually in Dia's collection, although for roughly the first decade of Dia's existence, she was the sole female artist amongst a cluster of early recipients of support from the foundation. She and her partner and collaborator Lamont Young were among that first cohort, as were Walter De Maria, John Chamberlain, Judd Flavin, Fred Zanback, Emmy Knobel, and a few others. The majority of Zazila's drawings nonetheless remain in her own possession. They are rarely seen, difficult to see, and have gone back into storage after two tantalizing years on the wall at Dia Beacon, not unlike the recordings of the Theater of Eten Eternal Music, her band, which are in a similar condition of antagonistic home confinement. The lecture will be about the drawings of Marianne Zazila and about the voice of Marianne Zazila because the drawings are about line and temporality and I believe the voice informs the line and the line informs the voice. 
It will also consist of a performance of a work as yet untitled, not for Zazila per se, but about her. It will be a speculative encounter with her line, which goes where her voice does not go, neither in the historical record nor in the music she performed, where vocalizing a single note, to my knowledge, was her zealous and decades-long sonic contribution to a body of influ influential music that we know today as early minimalism. The letters Y and Z, or X, Y, and Z, if X stands for the recombinant possibilities of quadrilateral symmetry, recur in the drawings. They percolate in her drawings and in her signature. These letters and their far out status are like signs of born to it eccentricity. It's kind of like Zazila knows that she's way out there at the end of the alphabet like she's announcing it, XXYY, XY. Zazila herself has written several explanatory texts about her works on paper. She has discussed the predominance of the letters Y and Z. Uh, these are her, her initial, obviously, and Young's. And her use of calligraphic styles inspired by two trips to Tangiers in 1960 and 1961. Although I couldn't resist pointing out that the Jewish calligraphic style known as mycography seems equally relevant. That's a um, 15th century Portuguese manuscript on the right. Um, she has written accounts of her research into the metaphysical significance of the handwritten word or the word-like image. For the most part, the writings spring from a metaphysics that already lines up neatly with Jung's exoticism when they meet in 1962. In 1963, she writes in a short essay called The Soul of the Word. If I choose to inscribe a word, I begin in the center of the page. The word first written is awkward and leans a little to the left. I go over the letters, adding characteristic curves, making the lines heavier. The letters grow larger, extend curled tentacles out toward each other, begin rubbing and burying their shoots in each other. I move the pen from left to right, adding ornaments. And now I'm skipping ahead a little bit. Some of the letters have sent wriggling lines beneath them, and the balance again requires correction, compensation. The word has now spread out of its letters. The letters are more and more obscured as the writing takes precedence. The word no longer matters. It can be spoken. But the writhing rising out of the word is a dragon devouring itself. Like a cat cleaning her fur, the tongue of the word licks its scales with flame, and the body of the word ignites and takes the shape of its destruction. Um, the only major catalog of Zazila's work is from the 2000 exhibition Marianne Zazila Drawings, which was mounted for five months in Poling, Germany, alongside a permanent version of Young and Zazila's Dream House and other, a couple of other of their installation works. Um, in his essay in that volume, Henry Flint characterizes her 30-year engagement with drawing, and of course her better known light works, as essentially uninterested in what he calls the going thing. Quote, the going thing did not concern her nor did she compete with it. I think he's mainly pointing to Zazila's relatively robust participation in the downtown scene between the years 1960 and the first half of 1962, giving fairly sudden way to a kind of long-term seclusion with Lamont Young, a trajectory lubricated, one should imagine, by sensual indulgence in what collaborator and dream music participator Tony Conrad will later call the eternal tar. That is, their apprenticeship to the teacher Pandit Pran Nath and the group spiritual practice of the theater of eternal music. 
We're invited to imagine Zazila executing the drawings, quote, aim of ecstatic elevation, those are Flint's words, uh, to the backdrop of drone music and hermetic relationships. While, meanwhile, something else, one could say everything else, or maybe everyone else, continues to unfold outside the loft. In 1961, Zazila is hanging out with Jack Smith, posing in his photo shoots. This is from his book, The Beautiful Book. Smith is writing the lead role in Flaming Creatures for Zazila. But she doesn't do it. She withdraws from the lead when she meets Young. In her own words, quote, Jack was crushed, but moving forward, he cast my high school boyfriend's wife, Sheila Bick, as the leading lady, just to keep everything incestuous. Around this time, she's also writing reviews for the Floating Bear newsletter, a mimeographed publication edited by then Leroy Jones and Diane De Prima, which was distributed downtown. Reviewing a painting show at the Guggenheim, she writes in 1961, I keep saying I was disappointed or disillusioned when in fact I was bored, almost without relief, all the way down the ramp. Not so much because most of the paintings in the show were bad, they were, as that they were so consistently uninteresting. There was a time I can remember when for all the really bad paintings cropping up all over town, there weren't so many that were actually dull. She goes on, what I mean by boredom is, oh, Ray Parker, again, as if it had ever been an achievement. Morris Lewis, beach awnings. Frank Stella, bright young boy makes good. Albers, forever and ever, square, and so on. Um, and apparently she received an angry postcard from Robert Motherwell after this particular piece came out for suggesting that his work, quote, peeks out over his wife's shoulder. Um, his wife was Helen Frankenthaler. I also, I have to add that personally, I can only hear um, this review in my head in the voice of uh, composer and contemporary, uh, Marianne Amache, whose greatest indictment was usually the pronouncement, this is so boring. <laughs> um, Flint makes the claim that Zazila ignores both, quote, formalist avant-gardism and its corollary, the going thing, which he qualifies as, quote, scandals, nasty art, etc by which I take him to mean participation, agonistic sociality. The intersection of these, say, in art rock bands, the downtown loft scene and its publications, and the new and contingent aesthetic sites offered by participation in music, things like flyers, announcements, record and cassette covers. All of this was, to a certain extent and for a certain time, a fertile area for Zazila, she began designing flyers in 1962 and did so for many years after, and record covers and the like. Um, and she should actually be counted in that first wave of musicians who start or join bands after studying painting in the late 50s, alongside the likes of John Lennon, Keith Richards, and Eric Clapton, and of course, dream music collaborator John Cale. But it's also, it's notable, I think, that she's in the US, um, not the UK, where the practice of leaving art school and joining a band was already gaining steam. Um, as I said, Zazila provides us with several detailed accounts of her own drawing practice. Um, but I saw my assignment here in different terms. My mind raced when I first encountered these portraits not the flyers and record covers with their inimitable feathery cursive, which are both gnomic and fairly canonical, like most aspects of Lamont Young's Gesamtkunstwerk, but the extraordinary symmetry studies with their meticulous plotting of primes, inversions, retrogrades, and retrograde inversions. To me, these drawings are unmistakably studies in the constituent materials of musical serialism, 
tools of world building in the already esoteric territory of the 12 tone matrix, the revolutionary anti system system of early 20th century modernism. Um, Arnold Schoenberg, and this is one of his so called magic squares or 12 tone matrices. Um, and after him, a half century of aspirational and contrarian composers were not a monolith in terms of political alignment, but there cannot be a version of serial composition that doesn't regard the imposition of new and mind-boggling, even sense-boggling rules as a bulwark against inherited paradigms of listening. This legacy is clear in the early young work, Trio for Strings, which was uh, 1958, which is uh, explicitly serial in structure, but in more implicit terms, in the entire project of Zazila of and Young's band, the theater of eternal music, which regarded the slowing down of time as a key tactic for cultivating a version of personal, though no longer societal, revelation. Let's take a moment to hear what we are talking about. You can kind of hear the drone part a little better as you turn it down. Um, I think one thing we can probably agree on that there's a very clear division of labor here. So all of those artists are performing the drone um, and Lamont is on the saxophone. That's from 19... That's a bootleg cassette. Uh, why it's so hissy. Um, here's a few years later. Um, this is just, uh, this is the, the commercial release. This is an excerpt from the commercial release that Matilda referenced in her introduction. Um, this is just the two of them and a sign tone. In the case of Schoenberg himself, the purposeful denaturalization of known and beloved harmonic relations was an explicit politicization of the aesthetic field. 
1923, that would have been in the service of reason and anti-fascism, an urgent and necessary rupture with the past. Of note, more or less precisely, a hundred years later, we face, we face an almost perfect inversion, call it the aestheticization of our political field, that is, hyper-rationality, soft or inverted totalitarianism, and cultural politics. I believe, and of course I will not be the first person to point to this, that the path toward this grinding inversion leads partly through the minimalism of Cecilia and Young. That this is what we are grappling with when we recognize that they are pivotal figures in converting the progressive aspirations of musical modernism into the esoteric and mystical orientalisms that they are known for. A music which, as it develops away from its roots in jazz and serialism and other programmatic forms of contestation and citing Ben Pickett's concept, contra-viviality, articulates its own version of authoritarianism. So about my piece, uh, I started with the idea of tracing over Zazila's line as one does with written music. That is, one follows, one briefly unravels, slows down in order to reconstruct or re-ravel. In other words, if we are following Zazila's lead and thinking temporally, musically, we are moving back and forth in time. We are braiding time and event. We are in the space of the line or the dot or the word and its inversion and we should consider the line's retrograde and the line's retrograde inversion, as she did. Perusing her mark-making thus, what I found was neither ahistorical nor entirely convincing as prayer or self-actualization system or any of the odd descriptors Zazila herself provides. Rather, and this might be a funny thing to say, I found a kind of lack, call it of alienation. It would therefore be incorrect to say I am returning a voice to the line or giving voice to the line, although I am definitely giving the voice, my voice and Jessica's voice, more notes. In conjuring these sounds and their inscription on these overlarge plates that you will hear in a moment, and the, the task I have given to Jessica is that her voice should meet both the surface, the morphology, and the color of these sounds. I don't know exactly what I am doing beyond that. If I did, we wouldn't be doing it. But then again, meeting Zazila's marks, I know I am reading them differently, that I am preoccupied with the contribution her designs and configurations make to an unresolved history. It is as if these portraits, riffing on the names of Zazila's and Young's patrons, it must be noted, are scaffoldings or buttresses keeping crushing forces, hunger, debt, competing histories of practice at bay. postponing the collapse of one system into another, which in the context of the loft scene of the 60s and 70s might have a more literal meaning than not. Tony Conrad makes sense of it thus. Though John Cale was brilliant enough to weld dream music into pop music directly and become enormously productive, Young and the others were trapped in the eternal tar and remained frozen in development. Young actually moved backwards toward the appropriation of exotic tonal and melodic practices from Indian music. And there is room for a final confession. It was indeed amateurish. Our recordings, should anyone ever be able to hear them, are of poor quality with outrageously poor balance in the mix. Lamont always turned himself up the loudest. <laughs> it's not that surprising. Uh, the group was frequently too stoned to play long enough with adequate focus. Our heterogeneity as performers often overcame our ability to muster group discipline. I am not saying that it was not appropriate or even perhaps essential that 
dream music was founded by people whose displacement from the temporal urgency of bourgeois music listening and whose radical denial of the social formulation of composition emerged also in parallel personal singularities, such as a hatred of work, elite religious practices, indulgence in intoxicants, or social disappearance. Finally, before I hand this vocal thread over to Jessica, I want to turn to Lauren Berlant, who helps me think about the particular aura pervading Zazila's figures. I've always been attracted to the pleasure of negation, the affective relative, perhaps, of the higher-minded operation we call inversion. Here's a short excerpt from a work of my own. This is from 2012. The work is called Six Inversions after Arnold Schoenberg. It's a two-channel video in which I use Schoenberg's, let's say, least favorite tools, more or less against him. Here, a reference to Cajun chance operations. It's possible to see the series of refusals led by Young and Zazila's acquiescence or subjection to them as a series of silencings. Zazila's phenomenological approach to light and sound from this perspective feels like an almost chemical outcome of these several overlapping hegemonic matrices that narrowed and focused the practices of early minimalism. I can see Zazila situated in a node, or possibly several nodes of these matrices, nodes that are canceling, quieting, or othering her contribution. It appears through this prism that Zazila withdraws or detaches from social life and from a certain autonomy as an artist that would have been her prerogative as a woman in the feminist foment of the 1970s and 80s. And of course, the world only too easily detaches from her. Certainly, Dia does. But to quote Berlant, it turns out that detachment is not antithetical to attachment, but one of its styles. It would be better to focus on perspectives on the disorganization and reorganization of subjects and worlds rather than to presume the possibility of reversals and negations. I take this to suggest that in the full flower of her energetic negativity, as in the early, more fashion-forward phase of critical engagement, Zazila's oscillations and permutations are best understood as a kind of refusal. The forces bearing down on these precise modulated surfaces are deflected. Zazila is not alienated. The word no longer matters. It can be spoken, meaning perhaps that the voice itself, unlike its legibility, cannot really be ignored, even as it circles back on itself traces and retraces the path of its own negation. For me, the line, that is the line that is a dragon devouring its own tail, not on a wave of tantric energy, but in the zone of something far more contingent, ambivalent, and stubborn. Thank you.
gue
Um... Uh. 